Um, Dr. Dan is right here at Dalhousie University in the Department of Physics and Atmospheric Science and the Department of Chemistry. He is, globally he is a globally recognized pioneer in the development of the lithium ion battery, a recent winner of the 2022 Killam Prize and currently working on the mil million mile battery sponsored by Tesla Motors. And I believe NSERC, the National Science and Engineering Research Council has some funding there as well. So Dr. Dan, I, we are all very excited about this. Thank you very much for coming and the floor is, is yours. Okay, nice. Well, I'm gonna share my screen because I have a, a presentation. Uh, does he have a slide, Charles? Uh, yes. Okay, I better come next. Yeah. I don't want to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> People can hear you. <laughs> okay, I hope you can see my screen and uh, yeah. see my laser pointer moving around. Okay. Perfect. All right, great. So I wanna talk about energy storage and the importance that it's going to play in the war on climate change. And I wanna first start by just talking about measuring energy and the unit, the kilowatt hour, the megawatt hour, the terawatt hour, uh, these are the most convenient units. And everyone should be familiar with the kilowatt hour because it's how you charge for the use of energy. It's on your power bill every two months. So a kilowatt hour is equivalent to using a thousand watts for one hour. So if you use a toaster, which takes about a kilowatt of electricity and you use it for an hour, that would use a kilowatt hour. It takes a kilowatt hour of energy to raise a metric ton of water or rock to a height of 360 meters. And you can recover that energy when you let the water or the rock back down. It takes a kilowatt energy to freeze 10 kilograms of water, assuming it's 100% efficient. You can heat 10 kilograms of bricks to 425 degrees C. You assume no heat loss with a kilowatt hour of energy. Seven meters per second of wind passing through two meters squared for an hour represents a kilowatt hour of energy. Sunlight striking four meters squared at the Earth's surface for an hour with 25% efficient solar cells allows you to generate a kilowatt hour. It takes a kilowatt hour of energy to drive a typical five kilometers in a typical car. 100 milliliters of gasoline stores one kilowatt hour. So gasoline is very energy dense, 10 kilowatt hours per liter. And two liters of charged lithium ion batteries, which would weigh about four kilograms, can store a kilowatt hour of energy. And, you know, we all complain about the high cost of electricity, 18 cents a kilowatt hour, but it's actually uh, pretty inexpensive when you think about doing things like eating 10 kilograms of bricks to 425 degrees C for 18 cents is a pretty good deal. Mm. So I want you to remember these numbers. Uh, you know, kilo is a prefix that represents a thousand, mega is a prefix that represents a million, and tera is a prefix that represents a trillion. So world energy use from all sources in uh, 2019, was 160,000 terawatt hours. And world power use, so well, instantaneously, how much power are we using? This is for everything, transportation, heating, industrial uses, everything. It's about 20 terawatts. So when you find these numbers, you should think about whether they make sense. So if you use 20 terawatts, all day long, multiply by 24 hours. And then every day of the year, 365 days of the year, and you do the product, you get 175,000 terawatt hours of energy. So that matches the 160,000 fairly closely. So things are pretty sensible. And when you look at this chart, which shows how 
Um, the energy that's used on our planet comes from the various sources. You'll see in 2019, it's 160,000 terawatt hours roughly. And of that, about 130,000 terawatt hours is made up from coal, oil, and gas. So roughly three quarters of the energy that we use today is coming from fossil fuels. And fortunately, when you look at the coal chart, it seems to be leveling off. And the oil chart is maybe starting to turn the corner, but gas is still <clears throat> going up. So what we have to do is eliminate the use of fossil fuels, not just in transportation, but in everything. And in some senses, it's a pretty depressing graph because it shows the magnitude of what we're facing. So we have to eliminate all these fossil fuels and let's hope that these, uh, you know, these, these lines for oil and gas don't keep trending upward here. So fortunately for us, solar and wind power are cheap and abundant. They're being installed rapidly worldwide. But the obvious problem is that the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. So we need energy storage, big time. And what are some of the sensible options that we have? Well, probably the most um, sensible option is called pumped hydroelectric storage. And this is conceptually very simple. When the wind is blowing or the sun is shining, you pump water from a low reservoir uphill to a higher reservoir. And then when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing, you let it back down through a pipe and you turn generators and generate electricity. So this is a picture of a pumped hydro facility uh, in Pennsylvania. And you can see the upper reservoir and the, the lower reservoir, which is a, a dam site. The largest pumped storage facility in the world is, is in Bath County in Virginia. It can store 30 gigawatt hours of electricity and it can discharge it all in 24 hours. I say it's perfect for Nova Scotia because we use about 20 gigawatt hours of electricity every, every day in the province. So if you wanted to store enough energy to you know, power the province for a day and a half or so, this, this could do the job. And the efficiency of these systems is about 70 to 80%. It's quite decent. And the cost is the lowest of energy, any of any energy storage system. The lifetimes are very long. Bath County was built in the 1980s and it's still functioning today. The drawback though is that the size of these reservoirs is massive. And for Bath County, the upper reservoir is 265 acres. The water level changes by 110 feet between charge and discharge, and the head height is 380 meters. So from the lower lake to the upper lake is 380 meters. And there's limited sites like this in the world, but every single one is, should be developed. And you might wonder, why, why do we have to move so much water? And the answer is really simple. It's because you have to elevate one ton of water a height of 360 meters to store only one kilowatt hour. So this gravitational storage of energy is, uh, takes a lot of space and you need the right geography. Another really nice way to store energy is uh, by electric thermal storage. And this works really well. About 20,000 Nova Scotians have it and it's here today. And the idea here is when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining, you would heat a box of bricks in your house to a temperature around 500 degrees centigrade. And then when you need to heat your home, when the sun or the wind are not available, you blow air through the brick stack and that heats your home. So at the moment in our province, people with electric storage units like, like myself, we, we get time of day rates for electricity. Between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., electricity costs is 50%. And that's when we heat the bricks in the winter time during the night. And then during the daytime, we don't use electricity for heating. We blow air through the brick stack. So at the moment, 
the use of electric thermal storage is not coupled to the availability of renewables, but it needs to be in the future. And with the smart grid, that will be possible. We need the, we need the opposite. You know, in places where air conditioning is a huge demand on the electricity grid in Florida, 27% of electricity in Qatar, 60 to 70%. In Israel, 42% of electricity used for air conditioning. So we need cold storage. So solar and wind can freeze a phase change material to deliver cooling when the sun is not shining or the wind is not blowing. So if you store cold as cold, it limits the need for electrical energy storage. And there's a company in Israel called Nostromo Ice Brick that has developed one of these cold storage units it's a very, very clever. Of course, lithium ion battery energy storage is also very popular. And this is one example of hundreds of projects that exist around the world. So need an energy storage product project going in in Southwestern Ontario. It will be a thousand megawatt hour energy storage facility. So one gigawatt hour, and it can deliver 250 megawatts. And lithium ion batteries are by far the most implemented electrical energy storage system today. And this is for a variety of reasons, including simplicity, smallest footprint and cost, as well as relatively long lifetime of the installations very good energy uh, storage efficiency around 90 95% and uh, you know they're they're being used everywhere so i want to talk now about lithium ion batteries and what can be done to make them better and um, how they can benefit us all in energy storage, both in vehicles and on the grid. So on September 6, 2019, we published this paper in the Journal of Electrochemical Society. And it really has a sort of a title that would you, make you not wanna read the paper. A wide range of testing results on an excellent lithium ion cell chemistry to be used as benchmarks for new battery technologies. We wrote this paper mainly because I was getting really annoyed at all the startup companies with, you know, novel battery systems that they claimed were better than lithium ion cells. And they would compare their testing results to some lousy lithium ion data from 2010 or something. So we wanted to put something out in the literature, you know, that credible people would compare their, their new technologies to. Anyway, in the abstract of this paper, I wrote this sentence. We conclude that cells of this type should be able to power an electric vehicle for over 1.6 million kilometers, 1 million miles, and last at least two decades in grid energy storage. Now, our research is funded in part by Tesla, about 50%. And because of that, the media follows what we do very, very carefully. And the very next day after this appeared in the journal, this appeared on the web electric. And it said, Tesla battery researcher unveils new cell that could last 1 million miles of robot taxi. And lots of other sites like Charged and Wired and Electric Mobility Canada picked up on this paper and published similar things. And this is where the so-called million mile battery was born, which was mentioned in the, um, in the release describing this, this uh, lecture here. So what can this uh, million mile battery do? So after the paper was published, we continued to charge and discharge many of the batteries featured in the paper. And here you can see what, uh, testing results at room temperature for cells charged and discharged between three volts and 4.1 volts. That represents going from full discharge to 80% state of charge. And these cells are being charged in one hour and discharged in one hour. So that 
in about three years of continuous testing, we can rack up 10,000 charge discharge cycles. So this line where my laser is moving represents the one hour discharge and one hour charge. Three years of testing with 10,000 cycles and virtually no degradation at all. If you charge to 90% full charge going up to 4.2 volts, you can see the degradation is a little bit more severe, but really not that bad over 10,000 cycles. And if you charge all the way to 100% state of charge, it's, uh, it's still incredibly good. You have over 80% of your original capacity remaining. So if every one of these um, charge discharge cycles represented a drive of 350 kilometers, these 10,000 cycles represent 3.5 million kilometers of driving. Anyway, when this particular graph was made, I don't know, it was maybe two years ago, these cells have still continue to charge and discharge. And every now and then I look at them and update them. And the graph on the left, I updated on March, 2022. Now we're out about 15,000 charge discharge cycles. And if you look at the one hour, one hour data, there's still you know, over 90% of the original um, energy storage capacity of the battery remaining. So you're talking about 5 million, 6 million kilometers of driving. And then it's important to try to predict, you know, how long these batteries would last at, uh, at room temperature and at elevated temperature. And we did that in, the, in that particular paper. And uh, one of the problems with lithium ion batteries is that they degrade more rapidly when they become hot. So at room temperature, we estimated you know, 90% 90, 90 of the original capacity of the battery after 25 years of operation. And at 40 degrees C continuous operation, 70% remaining after 10 years of continuous operation. And the corresponding drive distances are shown up on the top. So these lifetimes are pretty decent, but we need to make them much better as I'll demonstrate later in this uh, presentation. And a large part of my research focus is on that particular problem, actually. So these excellent lithium ion batteries, we really need to take advantage of them for energy storage. And one really important thing to think about is vehicle to grid. So here, the vehicle is undergoing charge discharge cycles while it's parked. So you, the utility has control of the battery while your vehicle's parked. And in so doing, they will pay you for access to your battery when your vehicle's parked and plugged in. Your vehicle battery represents an asset that they don't have to buy. So they will pay you for its, its use. So there's huge opportunities here for electric vehicle owners and for the you know, society as a whole. But people are very concerned because they say, oh, wait a minute now, my car is plugged in, it's charging and discharging, I'm, you're gonna wear out my battery. I don't, I don't want that to happen. And you know, this is where you need lithium ion batteries with 10,000 cycles so that the total vehicle driving range is not impacted by vehicle to grid operation. You know, the batteries I've described up on the previous slides 16,000 cycles, you know, you only need maybe eight or 900 to drive a very, as long as your vehicle will last. So you can use the rest for vehicle to grid operation. The other thing to recognize is you look at this chart, it shows you how the lithium ion battery um, market is growing over time. So from 2021 to 2030, there'll be a Oh, four or five-fold expansion in the production rate of lithium-ion batteries. And virtually all of those are going into the electric vehicle space. So this tiny little black bar represents the number of batteries that will, or the, the fraction of batteries that will be available for grid energy storage. You know, if you want to bring more solar and wind onto the grid, you have to be able to store energy for times when it's not available. And if you're not capturing 
all the, you know, a good fraction of the batteries in the vehicles with vehicle to grid, you're missing a massive opportunity because that's where most of the batteries are gonna go. There's a huge push to build more lithium ion battery manufacturing plants around the world. But the output of all those plants is already spoken for by vehicle makers. And that's what this big bar represents. So conventional wisdom as promoted by some battery and vehicle makers is that 800 charge discharge cycles is enough for a vehicle battery. So at 500 kilometers per, per charge discharge cycle times 800 charge discharge cycles, that's 400,000 kilometers of driving to the vehicle. And that's at least in Nova Scotia, much further than you would go before your vehicle would rust away anyway. But the, the point is in vehicle to grid operation, vehicles will be charged and discharged when parked maybe one or two partial discharge cycles per day. So that's 300, 600, 800 cycles per year, just when your car is parked. So 800 charge discharge cycles won't be enough. You need these long lifetime batteries, 10,000 cycles will be required. And I've demonstrated it's possible to make such batteries. In fact, even better batteries that we've developed over the last couple of years right now and those vehicles have a driving range on the order of 400 kilometers. They're not as energy dense as these uh, batteries that can drive a car 500 kilometers. And therefore the driving range that you would get will be less, but it enables vehicle to grid for many, many years. So several key original equipment manufacturers have announced vehicle to grid plans. Volkswagen, Nissan, Ford. There's so much buzz about the Ford 150 Lightning, you know, its ability to power your home in a power failure that, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, the other vehicle makers are gonna come along in the same, the same way. But you have to ask the question, will the power utilities be ready? Will they be ready to handle vehicle to grid. Uh, Nova Scotia Power has a vehicle to grid pilot project underway, which is a good thing. Will building codes mandate bi-directional EV chargers in new construction? And when you're you know, trying to purchase a bi-directional EV charger, if you try to do that today, you'll find out it's virtually impossible. The ones that, have, that do exist are just sold out for many, many months. So there's lots of things to think about here to be able to capture the energy storage capacity in all those vehicles that are going to be all over the place. So just to go on, you know, why do we need such awesome lithium ion batteries with such long lifetime and so many charge discharge cycles that they can undergo? Well, if you're doing grid energy storage from solar and wind, you know, maybe you're going to do daily storage. You'll charge when the sun shines or the wind blows. And then at night, when there's no sun, you'll discharge back into the grid. And in such a situation, you have about 400 charge discharge cycles per year, roughly one per day. So 10,000 cycles represents 25 years. And that makes sense. You need to match or exceed the lifetime of solar panels and wind turbines. And in fact, if the lifetime of the batteries was even longer, that would be even better. And doing this allows you to avoid recycling or at least de delay recycling and also de delay uh, manufacturing more, more batteries. And if these batteries are long lifetime batteries in electric vehicles, you can put the EV batteries into second use when the rest of the car dies. And I believe this is extremely important. And the cells, the lithium ion cells and the battery pack should be designed appropriately for second use. Another thing to think about is that once the lifetime of lithium ion cells are approaching 50 or more years, and we're moving that direction, it's relatively certain that the chemistry of the cells will last longer than the cell casing, the module hardware, and the battery management system. So this is another 
important challenge that we face. But there's an even more interesting thing to think about. I just, okay. Can you still hear me? I just got a message that my default speaker has changed. For a moment, we couldn't, but uh, you're perfectly clear now. Okay. So a really important question is, can we make enough lithium-ion batteries to meet all the needs of vehicle and grid energy storage? You know, that's a really interesting question. So let's consider that. So I mentioned some really daunting numbers at the beginning. We have to, based on 2019 numbers, we have to find 160,000 terawatt hours of energy every year to come from renewables. So right now about 30,000 comes from renewables and 130,000 comes from fossil fuels. So if you just say, or, so if you just say, we're gonna use solar and wind to generate all this, all this energy and solar and wind are not, only, not always available, let's just say that we have to store enough energy to power the planet for one day. Well, this is the yearly energy use. If you divide by 400, just to make the math easy, you would be using 400 terawatt hours of energy every single day. And if all that energy is gonna come from solar and wind and you wanna be able to store enough for one day use, you would need 400 terawatt hours worth of batteries ultimately to be deployed. Uh, this is a lot. World production of lithium ion batteries today is 0 0.3 terawatt hours. In 2030, it's estimated to be somewhere between two and six terawatt hours. So you would need this fleet of 400 terawatt hours of batteries deployed. And then you think about the importance of lifetime. The longer they last, the fewer need to be recycled and the fewer one needs to make every year. So if they last 50 years, that would mean to maintain this fleet of 400, you need to make eight terawatt hours of lithium ion batteries or some kind of advanced batteries every year. Eight times 50 is 400. And this is why we need really long lifetime batteries. And this is why it's a huge focus of my research effort. But then you have to ask the question, holy smokes, do we have the resources to deploy 400 terawatt hours of advanced batteries? Just as a sort of order of magnitude of, or a factor of two calculation, any single, any battery chemistry you can think of to deploy 400 terawatt hours of batteries, you'll need 500 million tons of positive electro material and 500 million tons of negative electro material. This is just massive amounts. And do we have the resources for this? Well, as a battery scientist, this is our playground, the periodic table. And this is all we have to work with to build uh, better batteries, okay? And if you ask the question, which of these elements is abundant enough to be used in batteries at the scale in 2030, where we're gonna be building between two and six terawatt hours of batteries per year. If you assume that lithium is abundant enough to be used at 2030 scale, lithium has an abundance in the Earth's crust of 20 parts per million. And if you assume that any other element that has an abundance of 20 parts per million or more can be used at the 2030 scale, this is the part of the periodic table that remains here, okay? But that's a 2030. We're gonna need a factor of 10, a factor of even more than 10, uh, more, more material to service the needs of energy storage from solar or wind. And if you ask the question, what elements are available at a factor of 10 more abundance? 
this is what the periodic table looks like. There's not much left, you know. So at the scale that we need for energy storage to eliminate fossil fuels, look what's remaining. And it's fortunate, it's very fortunate that from these elements remaining, we can make a pretty darn good sodium ion battery using sodium, manganese and iron, and carbon as the negative electrode material. So the sodium ion battery is the cousin of the lithium ion battery. It's just now starting to be developed. It will have a lower energy density than lithium ion. It will mean that you'll need a larger battery to store the same amount of energy. You'll need a heavier battery to store the same amount of energy. And at the moment, the lifetime of sodium ion batteries does not match lithium ion batteries. So there's a lot of work to do. We need to get this decades long lifetime from sodium ion, and we need this sustainable chemistry for the future. And that's a large part of what my research group is working on now. So I think I've given you some food for thought here, and I'd like to finish and open this up for questions. I have a question. I'm going to stop sharing so that I can okay. see people. Okay. First of all, I, I just want to uh, thank you for the presentation and for all the work you're doing. It's really fabulous and um, extremely important, I think, for the future of the planet. Um, and it's exciting that it's happening right here in Halifax and that you're doing it. Um, one of the questions that I had was in relation to the formulas and the technologies that you develop in your lab, where it's partially funded by Tesla and partially funded by a federal funding agency, what is the arrangement for being able for for various companies to be able to commercialize it? Like, is there are there restrictions placed by Tesla on what you can do with it so that it's you, you might come up with these, I mean, you have already come up with these wonderful things, but are they going to be usable by all the different manufacturers or are there restrictions that way? Uh, the story that I told you today about the million mile battery, you know, that's public domain in a published journal article. And um, there is no uh, intellectual property surrounding that at all. That's fantastic. So virtually anybody is available to uh, to go ahead and do that. In fact, there are companies in China that make very similar uh, battery chemistries to what I talked about. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's, that's 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 incredible to hear, and and really encouraging to hear. That's not the way it works for everything that we do. Uh, right. Our arrangement with Tesla is you know, they get the intellectual mm -hmm. property. And that, that's fine. But um, everything that we do gets published in the open literature. And it may turn out to be the case that uh, if somebody wants to use that uh, information, they might have to take a license from Tesla or whatever. But there's no, there's no secrets after a, a patent is filed. Everything gets published. OK. But with the patent, so the patent could could limit its usability by other companies, but with licensing and so on, then that could that could be overcome. It's not necessarily an impediment to widespread use. Yeah, and, and you may remember that at one point, Elon Musk made all his patents available for electric vehicles to just try to really stimulate wow. the growth of EVs around the world. I and didn't I think, know. I didn't know that actually. That's that's. I'm, I'm impressed by that. I didn't know. Yeah, that, didn't know that. that was around 2015 or 2016 that that oh. happened. So oh, these were yeah. patents, you know, about electric drive and regenerative braking and battery oh. pack construction and stuff like that. Okay, that's very impressive. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I, I might take the liberty to, to jump in with the next question, uh, although I didn't do this, but going forward, uh, yeah, if folks have a question, uh, if you're able to just uh, do the raise hand function, uh, then we can sort of navigate it back. Uh, no, no, no worries, Brian. Uh, so yeah, Professor Dan, obviously just completely fascinating. Um, 
yeah, I'm, you know, I'm still sort of reeling from, from many of the things that you said, but um, one question I have for you is, is you pose this question uh, within your swap slides, uh, what can utilities do to, you know, are they ready for vehicle to grid? Uh, and what can they do to get ready for that? Um, do you, to your mind, do you have any solutions uh, thus far, or are we still in the phase of sort of just asking these questions? Well, it's going to be really interesting once a large fraction of drivers are driving EVs, you know, what's, what's going to happen. I've already had conversations with utilities where they say, like it or not, baby, you're going to be doing vehicle to grid because you're going to plug in and expect a charge and hey, maybe there's not juice available. So for you to get electricity, you may have to steal it from another vehicle owner at that moment. And they're not gonna let you charge when the demand is really heavy. You'll be charging in the middle of the night, for example, or when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining. So it's going this way. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, here, here in our province, the fraction of EV drivers is incredibly low. I don't know, it's probably less than 1% still. But in other jurisdictions, they all, all like California and, and British Columbia, they must already be running into this issue, and Norway for that matter, running to this issue, like how do you deal with all of this on the grid? And I don't know what the answers are, but those places will be, you know, model systems for us to take a look at. Thanks for that. And I'll, I'll open it up to uh, the rest of the floor. I, I think I saw a question in the, in the chat. Oh, here it is. Uh, so uh, uh, Bob Kerr wants to know, uh, uh, what do such other elements like cobalt um, use in, in lithium ion batteries uh, limit further development of those cells? I, I'm not, the wording in the question is a little bit uh, complicated, but I, I think he wants to know about the, the use of, uh, of cobalt uh, within lithium ion batteries. Yeah, so, um... I guess in 2016 or so, when we started our work with Tesla, one of the things, challenges we were given was to figure out how to eliminate cobalt from lithium ion cells. And I would say in the next two years, we were very successful in developing um, nickel manganese um, systems that have no cobalt at all. And that, and then the Tesla guys came to us and said, well, you've done a great job eliminating cobalt. Now you have to eliminate nickel because people are concerned about the availability of nickel going forward as well. And that can be done too. Okay, so you can, you can eliminate or at least minimize the use of nickel. So one of the very popular battery chemistries now is lithium iron phosphate, which uses uh, iron and phosphorus, both very, very abundant, but still coupled to lithium less abundant. So, you know, it's, it's possible to completely avoid cobalt. And I think over time that will happen as the scale of this whole thing becomes larger and larger. Uh, the availability of cobalt is, is not, not sufficient. I see a question there. It says, is lithium widely available in Canada? There's a lot of lithium uh, deposits across the country. I would say the most famous one is uh, called Namaska in uh, Quebec. So the Namaska mine has been under development for quite some time. And very recently, a 50% share was purchased by a large lithium producer called Livent. And at that point, it becomes real because Livent knows what they're doing. They produce a lot of lithium in South America, they're, I think, you know, we're in the top five lithium producers in the world. So across the country, there's a lot of small, you know, startup junior mining organizations that have lithium deposits, but nothing is as far along as, as the Namaska mine. But overall, yes, we have a lot of lithium in Canada.
I see some hands up, uh, Jacob, maybe. Jacob just, oh, there he is. He might be muted. I don't hear him. No, me neither. So, so sorry, okay, I have so let's my go hand. to Brenda in the meantime. Yeah, okay. So I have my hand up, but I don't actually see it there. But I, I just wonder, we're, we're an advocacy group. And um, I was particularly struck by, you know, your comments about the grid that they, it has to be able to take, you know, the buy, you know, by uh, the EV charges have to be bi-directional, right? And of course the new building codes, we've been having some discussions and doing some work on the building codes as well, that new builds have to have EV charges. So I'm wondering, aside from those two things, uh, you know, it seems to me that's a role that we could fill in terms of um, putting some pressure on government to move on that. Uh, are there other things that we could be doing as an adv advocacy group to see if we can't push this agenda forward? Oh, sorry, you're on mute, Dr. Dan. Yeah, I was kicked out of the meeting, so I came back. I didn't hear Brenda's question, so you could ask again, maybe. Oh, sorry, it was about the bi-directional EV chargers, that that was one thing you mentioned. And I have to tell you that I saw that video on Ford Lightning 150, and I thought, I want one. <laughs> I just thought, that just completely blew me away. But we're, we're an advocacy group, and I see a role for us in <clears throat> lobbying <clears throat> or advocating to government about uh, having, well, pushing Nova Scotia power into bi-directional um, chargers and also we've been doing some work on the building code and I think that's another area where we could try to advocate for making sure that new builds have the appropriate EV chargers but are there other things that that we could be doing that you see there might be a role for us to push this uh, agenda forward faster? Well um, you know it's really nice I've been interacting with people at Nova Scotia Power in Namera quite a bit recently, and they are really keen to get going on all of this. And to Amira? some degree, yeah, Amera, Amera is, are they? Okay. oh, hell yes. They, they actually have a project going on with a local company called Novonics to develop um, home energy storage systems for the, the Florida, um, area that Amera services with electricity, which is around Tampa. So that's happening here in Nova Scotia, developing these systems and they'll be shipped down to Florida and then deployed there. So that's pretty cool. And in Nova Scotia Power, they wanna move ahead as fast as they can to be ready for this um, bi-directional charging vehicle to grid. But to some degree, they're handcuffed by the utility review board because to make it all happen, it, it requires investment, right? So where does the money come from? You know, if they wanted to say, okay, we're gonna raise your power rates by a penny or two so that we can do this stuff, no way it can happen. The utility review board won't let them do that, right? Because the consumers don't wanna pay extra money for their power. So it's kind of, it's kind of a, Catch twenty two situation, you know how does how do we move forward? And maybe the government has to step in and say, okay, look, this has to happen. We want to enable it, and we're going to make it happen by some mechanism, whatever that is. So finding the funding to make this work, um, I think, is important to to do. Thank you. Do we have? So Jacob seems to be ready. I'll, I'll try. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, it's good. Oh, uh, uh, excellent. Uh, uh, thank you for, uh, for this presentation. It's interesting to see the n numbers uh, worldwide and like uh, how much would be uh, required. I was actually just at the URIB hearings and it's a very procedure heavy process, but like they, they do most of the work on uh, capital investments, like as through the IRP process. So my questions relates to something you talked about uh, 
in the m mining for lithium around the world in reserves uh, and also for the sodium ion uh, chemistries. What would you see as major or key steps to improve the uptake, like in Canada and in the States, to get more batteries uh, uh, produced? Like, uh, and, and I'll use a more specific example, like with, with wind and solar in Europe, either offshore or onshore and North America, that they have trained staff who know how to install them. And like they, they have, uh, like they basically go through the, the trades and know how to, how to properly build these things. I, I don't know if we have a lot of, uh, I, I, I know we have lots of skilled trades in Nova Scotia, but I'm not sure if there are specifically like experts across Canada who, who build big grid scale batteries. And I was curious if you, if you thought there were some sort of things that the government could do either federally or provincially to to improve this push because we we can't get off fossil fuels until we have the, 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 this option and i have one other secondary question is i don't know if the the periodic table the elements map of the world so that was in the crust and in the atmosphere i've heard somebody mention i don't know if it's even scientifically possible to to extract lithium from seawater and i don't know the ecological impacts of that or or how much might be in the ocean and, and if it's even a good choice or not, but uh, I'd be interested in those those questions. Sorry. Okay, I'll start with the lithium in the seawater question first. The lit, there is lithium in seawater, but the concentration is really low. I think if you summed it up throughout the entire ocean, it would be a significant amount. But since the concentration is really low, extracting it economically at present is incredibly difficult. So then let's talk about the other question. So. Um, in the United States, they recently passed something called the Inflation Reduction Act. And in there are all kinds of incentives for vehicle makers and battery materials makers to do it in North America. So as an example, if you build a lithium ion battery in North America, which will cost you on the order of $100 a kilowatt hour to do that, you get a rebate from the federal government of the US of $35 a kilowatt hour, okay? So if you build it off offshore, you know, it might cost you $90 a kilowatt hour, but then you don't get that $35 a kilowatt hour rebate. And the same is true for battery materials manufacturing. There's huge amounts of incentive to do it in North America. And this just is like a switch. Like I've seen it happen in, my industrial partner, their focus has just gone from, you know, do it anywhere to do it here because of this incredible incentive. And I don't, I don't know what else is in that Inflation Reduction Act, but there's a lot dedicated to um, electric vehicles, batteries, materials, battery manufacturing, and so on. So there is a way to make stuff happen. And I, I, you know, it's part of life. Money seems to talk, right? Thank you. Can I just jump in here? I think it's pretty clear that we've sort of lost our manufacturing capacity. Uh, and that became very clear during COVID, right? That we don't tend to manufacture a whole bunch of stuff now in Canada. It's all migrated elsewhere. And, you know, the federal government could try to turn that switch back on. Yeah, well, one of the things that's important about electric vehicles and then batteries is that they're heavy, you know, so shipping stuff all over the world to, to make these things just doesn't make a lot of sense. So in Canada, we have the materials that were necessary to make lithium ion batteries. We have the graphite, nickel, lithium, manganese, and we have cheap hydroelectric power in Quebec. So manufacturing companies have decided, okay, let's set up shop in Quebec. So there are lithium ion positive electro material makers that have uh, committed to, to uh, build plants in Quebec. There are lithium ion battery makers that have committed to build in Ontario and I think shortly in Quebec. So we're gonna develop this, this infrastructure in Quebec and in Ontario and maybe other parts of the country too. So it makes sense to do a lot of in Canada because of cheap power and the resources are here. Why ship them over to Asia and then ship the batteries and the cars back? It doesn't make any sense, you know? So I, th I think 
I think things are going to go in the right direction as far as this uh, vehicle space, the electric vehicle space goes. And we have to make sure the same thing happens for the grid grid storage batteries, which are going to be at least at least 10 times bigger than EV in the future, at least. Uh, Nigel, yeah. Nigel has a yeah. question. Dr. Jeff, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. I have two questions. Um, one question is about the manufacturability of the million mile battery. Tesla currently manufacturing 4680 at the Gigaplant in Texas. And I know they're running into sort of some manufacturing issues. Is the million mile battery in terms of manufacturability, quite a deviation from what they're currently making. That's my first question. And then the second question is how long, and I don't want to hold you right to the specific day, but how long do you think that we'll be seeing this sort of the millionth mile battery or the millionth kilometer, as I should call it, uh, in, in vehicles? Yeah, so this uh, million mile chemistry is totally standard, more or less, easy drop in. Um, and, you know, Tesla's been incredibly bold with the 4680. They haven't just changed the shape and size of the battery, they've changed a lot of the manufacturing processes. They've gone from traditional wet coated electrodes to an all dry technology for making electrodes as one example, and bringing that equipment onto mass production scale has taken a bit of time, but those challenges are um, virtually now overcome. So the batteries are being made in the Austin, Texas plant and they're going into cars and the cars are rolling off the line. The plant's not at full capacity yet, but it will be, you know, and this is, I remember, Tesla's battery day in September of 2022, where Elon Musk, you know, made all these bold projections about what they're going to do. And it's, it's at that point, I think everybody around the world, the battery people were saying, wow, this is really bold, but he's achieved these things one after the other. And it's quite astounding. You know, I don't know if I answered the other question. I can't remember. <laughs> How long before we see them in vehicles? Oh, oh yeah. You know, there's a, a lot of vehicles that have in them chemistry very similar to the million mile um, chemistry. And in fact, even with a standard vehicle, with, um, you know, a, a typical Tesla, for example, if you operate the battery uh, in a friendly way, which means maybe charge it only to 70 or to 80% routinely and don't discharge it below 30, 20% routinely, that, that vehicle is going to last you an incredibly long time. Um, the main degradation modes happen at the top of charge and the bottom of discharge in the, in the chemistry that are used. So, you know, when you need to go on a long trip now and then, no problem, charge to 100%. But normally keep it 70, 80 percent and you're going to last a very long time. So I think things, things are in pretty good shape. But if you want to do vehicle to grid, then you're talking about a different animal. You need a, a very long lifetime battery. Yeah. Thank you. I see uh, Tanette has her hand up here. Hi there. Um... Sorry for the background noise, it's the first time here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, two questions. I'm curious, and I may be misremembering this, but I, I've heard something about it being possible to, to, there's a process to get brine from abandoned oil wells. So that's question one. Uh, question two is wondering whether we're, using our hydro resources as effectively as perhaps we could and whether it might be uh, worth looking at transitioning some of the hydro resources to pumped storage hydro while bringing on more wind and solar. Yeah, so with respect to the brine question, you're right. 
there is there are a few companies that are looking at extracting lithium from brines that are near the oil um, oil sands, but I'm not I don't know much about it. I've heard of it too, like you have. And we with respect to pumped hydro, um, we should be developing every possible uh, site that makes sense. In our province, you know, when you think about, okay, where's there a lot of water at a low level? And then where's there's a, a big hill nearby with a place that you could make a giant reservoir? You know, the, <laughs> not too many places other than Cape Breton, really, I would say, right? And maybe, maybe we need to be looking at developing these pumped hydro facilities. It's certainly, uh, would be nice, but they're very expensive and they'll take a lot of land and they need a lot of water. So, yeah, I see abandoned coal mines. Well, maybe. Okay, I guess Brian's up now. Uh, yes, uh, two things coming out of things that you've said recently. Uh, I, I think what Tanette was suggesting was not creating new pump storage, but using the existing hydro resources in the same way that pump storage could be used. So do we already have a huge capacity to balance out the renewables by using the existing hydro resources that we have all over the country? And, you know, it's concentrated in certain places like Quebec and Manitoba um and bc particularly but it's but you know is that is that enough that it, it could mean that, that the renewables could uh achieve a much higher penetration just using those existing resources in the same way that you would use new new pump storage that's one question and the other question i had was um you you were saying uh that the utility scale batteries would be 10 times the requirement of electric vehicles. Is that what you were talking about before about using electric vehicles as the storage batteries? So if you have the if you have the no. long life EV batteries, no, okay. So I need another you need another further factor of 10. Yeah. Okay. It's just massively massive. Okay, okay, I get it now about the hydro thing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's funny because I used to wonder why why is Quebec building so much wind capacity when they have all this hydro capacity? And the answer is exactly what you say. You know, they sell a lot of electricity to the New England and hopefully soon to us here in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is like you say, balancing the wind with, with the hydro. And that's a perfect solution. So you don't run as much water through your dam, you save it and use electricity from the wind and the sun in the meantime. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good way to do things. Thanks. Good. Do I have time for one more quick question? How are, how are we doing for time? Well, we're a little, we're a little over. <laughs> and I'm sure Dr. Dan has other things to do, but you know, let's have another question. Sure, one more, let's go. All right, uh, so this one's about uh, battery recycling and, and um, second life uses that you mentioned. Uh, obviously, like we here at the EAC, we advocate for a number of things around electric vehicles. So that's supply mandates, that's the increased charging, uh, higher rebates. Uh, but one thing I try and tell people, um, oftentimes when you get this question about like the need for mineral resources is that we need to do battery recycling better. Um, and and you know, you have a really interesting perspective on battery recycling. Uh, when Quebec came out with uh, what's called extended producer responsibility, they sort of put, uh, uh, you know, uh, the cutoff period that they put was, I believe, about 10 years uh, for batteries. And they said, OK, after that, we're going to mandate that they be recycled. Uh, and you came up publicly and said that doesn't make a lot of sense because uh, then you're only incentivizing people to make batteries that last 10 years, right? And everything that you said, you know, from everything you said, that's that's obviously a problem. Um, so my question for you is a, is a bit of a complicated policy want question, but uh, you know, what's what's the solution when you're designing and mandating battery recycling? Uh, you know, how do you do this to ensure that batteries are recycled, that that they're 
you know, used in second life applications while not kind of uh, limiting uh, the R&D work that goes on in that way? Well, a battery that comes out of a vehicle that still has uh, use, useful energy storage capacity, that has a lot of value. And I think that, you know, companies or entrepreneurs are going to realize, you know, we can use these things in second life applications. It's happening already. You know, people take Tesla packs apart and, and take the modules and use them in other, other devices. And second, second life is possible, it can be done. Okay, so then what about recycling? I can tell you that a stack of used electric vehicle batteries has a way higher concentration of nickel, lithium, manganese, and for the ones that contain cobalt, cobalt, than you would find anywhere in the ground, okay? It's an urban mine. And the recycling activities, you know, people doing R&D and recycling and companies doing recycling have become pretty good. Heard a report recently of 98% recovery of all the valuable metals from a from recycled you know, lithium ion battery uh, scrap. That's really good, 98%. And I think that that's going to be the norm. So, you know, the, the, the elements in these batteries are just too valuable to throw away. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. Be sure, be sure of it. That's fascinating. Thank you so much. Okay, let's wrap. Thank you very much, Dr. Dan, for joining us this evening. And you've generated a lot of really good thoughts and better understanding on what's going on in your world and the implications for everyone. So thank you for taking the time to. Um, okay, and share I'd like to thank tonight. the Ecology Action Center for what you people do. It's great and keep it up. Thanks a lot. Okay, good night. Best of luck. Okay, good night.